Dunedin based uh, historian Tyler West. G'day, Tyler. Hey, how you Andy doing? Hughes. Good, good, good man. Afternoon, evening, evening. Yeah, um, Tyler, Aussie election. You're you're a you're an expert when it comes to to Aussie politics and that sort of thing. So we thought we'd get you on to sort of give us the the rundown of, of what's taken place over there. Because me and Pat are a bit sort of lost. You know, we haven't really <laughs> been following it, and it it seems like uh, there's a, a Labour government over in Australia, which um, seems like that hasn't you know been a thing for a while so we've got anthony albanese what's his sort of deal and how do you reckon he's he's ended up winning this this election um albanese i mean there's been some talk in the murdoch press um about albanese being you know associated with the hard left of the party but realistically he's pretty moderate as far as australian labor mps go um i think this has been, and you see this in the, especially the Teal candidates, um, a vote against the ruling Liberal National Coalition. Um, just like the old adage goes in New Zealand, people don't vote for a new government, they vote against the old one. Um, I think that very much has been true in this election that's just passed this weekend. Who, so who are the, I've heard this Teal, the Teal independents, I've heard this in, in the in the headlines and that sort of thing. I mean, who are they and ha, did they really sort of, did they swing this election? Um, teal is just generally the colour associated with independent candidates. Uh, a lot of the independents that got in this time, there's seven new ones, I'm pretty sure, are more in the kind of liberal progressive camp. Um a really big thing pretty much across the board has been uh, climate change and the perceived Liberal National Party in action on climate change. And another big one is a federal ICAC. Um, I forget exactly what ICAC means, but essentially an anti-corruption co commission is another big one that's come up in a lot of the independent campaigns. Yeah. So what, Pat, do you want to jump in? I was going to say, I'm looking at it right now, 10 independents, 4 Greens. Um, that that's a big number of independents, and and that's why you know under the the electoral system they have it's still going to be a minority government. Um, it's an interesting conversation maybe for another day about electoral systems and how often now around the world, no matter what your electoral system is, whether it's first past the post, whether it's you know ranking them, whether it's MEMP, that so often we're seeing um, minority governments with a bunch of independents, or as in New Zealand, minority governments with. Uh, with, a, with a minor party coming in to make up the difference. Yeah, because 10 independents is a lot. I mean, from thinking about, like I'm just looking back over the, the years previous, that three independents in the previous election, two before that, two before that, four before that. So double figures of independents, um, as you were kind of hinting at, is it a protest vote or is it a swing towards... Local MPs are a really important thing, yeah? And if you can win your local community, no matter what party you're for, you can be voted in. And I wonder if it's talk about... Um, these independents getting into their local communities and and saying I'm the best person for you no matter who I what party I'm in which is none or if it's a, a protest vote or if it's like a I don't know either of these parties support me completely so we'll just go for the I, I think when you say the teal option I think about I talk about New Zealand uh, independent voters or swing voters being purple because it's a mix of green and uh, sorry a mix of blue and red so that's probably similar towards right. them when they talk about the teal independent so it's a it's a it's a pretty impressively large number for what's happening, and it'll be interesting to see how that pans out because obviously they'll need some independents to make a make a government, and if any of those independents will be able to use that to further their own uh, sort of policies in a new Labour government. Well, they might not yet. There's still a handful of seats that are yet to be declared. Um, I think there's about six, seven that haven't been declared yet, and Labour needs two more at the moment. It's had... Right. 74 just shy of the 76 it needs to form government so it might just get a majority government by you know you know by a hair's breadth they might get to a majority government um if not most of the independents i think possibly all of them and the greens have both signaled that they are willing to work with labor um labor a big part of their campaign was that they wanted to get to a majority government and happy to have friends in parliament, but they wanted to have a parliament that would not rely on the crossbench. Um, and they might still just get there 
I think it's probably likely that they'll get somewhere in the realm of 76 or 77 in the end once the final count in this last few real edge cases comes through. It'll be interesting to see if they do something with a majority like, you know, obviously Labour here in New Zealand got in with a majority for the first time since MMP came in. And uh, other than probably putting through, you know, uh, COVID legislation, they seem to have done very little with their, with their um, majority, like they, what they could have done. They could have been transformative as a government because they didn't have to rely on anybody else. And they seem to, in my opinion, have wasted that opportunity. If they get it, to, if they get to a um, majority government in Australia, um, any ideas what the the kinds of things that an Australian Labor government will want to bring in? Will they look to be transformative, or will they just be a bit ho hum, play the political game, keep Australia ticking on as it is? I think there's probably a couple of things that they'll try and get started, you know, by Christmas or within the first hundred days or whatever metric you want to use. Personally, I think it's going to be a bit meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, given how comparatively moderate picking Albanese, especially after Shorten at the last election, who was perceived to be um, very closely aligned to the party's union wing. Albanese is by no means aligned to the party's union wing, even though you know the unions in Labour are a lot more politically active in the party than they are here. Um, but with that being said, I think a couple things. Um, a federal ICAC, like I mentioned with the um the teal independence i think they'll probably be wanting to have the bare bones of that independent commission um i think they're calling it the national anti-corruption commission they'll want to have the bare bones of that fleshed out ready to be put in place ready to start um start hearing cases uh in the relatively near future they also campaigned on a federal inquiry into the robo debt scandal which um, harried the the ruling coalition for pretty much since the initial robo debt scheme was brought in brought into place in about mid twenty sixteen, um, and continued to be ongoing bad news for them um, after the scheme was scrapped in twenty twenty. So I think beginning the inquiry into the robo debt scandal would probably also be something that they want to push through because it also um is one of those policies that's just going to continue after the election making the LNP look bad so they would be wanting to get onto that because it's both a promise they can keep and say that they've done and also something that's going to make the previous government keep looking bad even once the elections in the rearview mirror yeah. hey um since but, since um Kevin Rudd won and I think it was 2007 wasn't it and beat um John Howard John Howard was not thinking for four terms there's, it's been a pretty vicious place to be a Prime Minister of Australia. Like, I'm looking at some of the results right now, and every every year, bar the last two with Scott Morrison, there's been some kind of you know, coup or, or in the middle of a, a, a cycle. So Kevin Rudd was replaced by Julia Gillard. Julia Gillard then won, was replaced again by Kevin Rudd. Kevin uh, Rudd uh, then lost to Tony Abbott, who was then replaced by Macken Turnbull. Turnbull won, who was replaced by Scott Morrison, a full term of Scott Morrison. Historically speaking, is this something that we see in Australian politics, or was it just a really weird sort of decade? Uh, I mean, I think of the National Party in New Zealand and how many leaders they've had over the past sort of five to seven years. Is it just a an anomaly or is it some part of Australian politics that they do like to stick the knife in the back and kind of roll people? No, it was uh, something of an anomaly uh, in the in the broader historical term. You look at um, the Hawke Keating government, the Howard government and the Fraser government, and you have three of the main governments up to Rudd's election sitting for multiple terms without you know, yeah, big right. ructions within the governing party. There was a point, I think, around, it would have been around when Morrison rolled um, Turnbull, where Australia had had six prime ministers in six years. And that is really unusual. The last decade has been a really, last decade and a half has been a really um, rocky one in terms of party politics in Australia. I'm not entirely sure why, personally. Um, but it's definitely the case that that was pretty unusual in in the broad historical term in Australia. Right. All right. Tyler, what do you think of the sort of the the constants in Australian politics between the two parties? Like the things that sort of, I guess, make them 
just same same but different right is it is it, is it maybe an immigration policy is labor and the and the liberals are they sort of similar around immigration i mean is it um uh, you know, I, the reason I asked is because we were th we were talking about Pauline Hanson and One Nation beforehand, and I, I I sort of wondered, you know, if that sort of racial aspect or anti-immigration aspect is maybe something that runs through a, the whole of Australian politics, not just the little niche parties like like One Nation. Yeah, when it comes to turnbacks and offshore detention, Labor made clear right at the outset that. They support boat turnbacks. They support continuing offshore detention. Um, the one thing that they have said that they want to tweak um, in the the refugee and immigration policy is uh, they want to move a lot of the refugees who are on temporary protection visas onto permanent protection visas. Um, because it was policy under the previous coalition government to just keep renewing these temporary visas that refugees had made it to Australia on, which would leave people kind of in limbo for, you know, in some cases a decade or more, um, or close to a decade. So that's the one area where Labour kind of differentiates itself, but it's really just tweaking. It's it's Again, it's one of those splitting hairs things. Um, it's something that runs through pretty much all of Australian politics. And I think it's one of those things that the Green Party, with their um, major wins in Queensland, have really differentiated themselves because they flat oppose um, offshore detention and boat turnbacks. So they were able to really differentiate themselves from, from the coalition, from Labour, from the smaller right-wing parties. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that means if 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 there's similar sort of immigration and you know I, I was thinking of the detention centers but also and you know the sort of anti South Asia immigration that that is popular there uh, and sort of underlines things I guess also in terms of the the New Zealand relationship with it with Australia as well where we are we just gonna sort of see status quo when it comes to the the sending back of um, you know, uh, New Zealand uh, citizens that have never leave, lived in New Zealand to to New Zealand. Yeah, um, Labor also supports continuing deportations under Section 501 of the Migrant Act, which I'm pretty sure is where a lot of those um, New Zealand New Zealand citizen New Zealand citizens who have been deported to New Zealand, even when they've lived in Australia pretty much their whole life. I'm pretty sure that's what they come under. I mean, just on Sunday, um, a Kiwi woman, um, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Um, seemingly quite likely committed suicide in uh, Villawood Detention Centre. So it's something that, you know, right from the outset, it's going to continue to be a strain. And of course, the the worst aspect of that is the actual human lives that mm. are being affected um in australia um regardless of whether they're new zealanders or not but especially new zealanders who are caught in that situation because it's going to be such a um such a, a sticking point in australian and new zealand relations going forward and well, that doesn't really look like it's going to change under labor but it was it was interesting mm. to hear the prime minister here talking about that she was that was the first thing that she was asked like the day after he won and she basically had to go hang on guys he's been in there for minutes I, i've contacted him and i've spoken to him and what we spoke about is when we will get together and talk about things for some reason some of the media in new zealand expected her to be you know, like day one congratulations on the win now about immigration and about exp you know and she said, I don't know what I was watching. It was one of the mainstream media outlets. She said that the problem is we deport as well. So we deport the, the, on similar to what Australia does. Um, I, I don't think we have quite the same policy for Australians who have been here since, you know, they were four years old, so to speak, which is a difference between us and Australia. But I don't think it's also necessarily as cut and dry between Australia and New Zealand governments because we both deport um, back to the homeland, the origin of birth of these countries. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out as it goes along as well. But there's the story, by the way, a New Zealand woman in her 30s has reportedly been found dead in an Australian uh, detention centre. There you go. Yeah, I guess the, the other thing is, 
Tyler, that I had on my list anyway is climate change. And I'm, I, we've talked about the sort of the 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 variable of the independents and, and the three seats that the Greens, just from my info over here, seem to have in the House. And then um, for the Senate, 12. Um, you know, that's... I mean, that, I don't know if that's sizable. You can tell us if that's uh, if that's a sort of if that's a big sort of change in 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 Australia. But and I, I imagine, and you can answer this as well, that that climate change has been a sort of election uh, issue uh, over there. And I'll just quickly um, point out some a comment that we got here um, from Simple Reality, sort of hopefully saying that uh, the ALP will be, be implementing a more progressive climate change policy which will be pushed by the independents and, but as well. And sorry, I'll just also highlight this comment here. Mortal mm -hmm. Weir uh, voted for Labour, but glad to see a lot of independents to keep them, uh, keep the main two parties in check. Also glad to see the Greens got more support this time for the same reason. Yeah. Thoughts there, Tyler? Yeah. Um, I think it's worth remembering that since the last election in Australia, there's been... The, those terrible bushfires, which um, happened right before the pandemic kicked off, and two really serious statewide um, instances of, of flooding, as well as persistent drought in some parts of the country as well. So what I think we're seeing is climate change has become a bread and butter issue rather than being something that's a bit of a special interest issue. It's a, it's a bread and butter issue for large parts of the country now. Um, and I mean, that flooding um, impacted one of the seats, quite heavily impacted, I think Griffith, it's either Griffith or Ryan, um, one of the seats that the Greens won. So that's an on the ground issue for voters in those seats. Um, it is a really, really big shift in Australian politics. The Greens are, with this election result, pretty close to just cementing themselves as the third party in Australia. And Australia has been despite having um, a lot of minor parties, um, a hell of a lot of minor parties, it can be, you know, pretty confusing if you want to vote below the line and individually number all of them, because sometimes you have 30, 40, 50 parties on the ballot. Um, it's been pretty... Uh, the two major parties have managed to uh, retain quite a hold on Parliament, so the Greens making this really big breakthrough, which has been a mixture of... Um, a mixture of traditional on the ground campaigning. I think uh, Adam Bant said that in Griffith, they knocked on every single door in the electorate, perhaps more than once. Yeah. Um, uh, it's been a mixture of kind of like building up this traditional party machine in Queensland, as well as having policies that directly address climate change because Queensland is, has, has repeatedly witnessed um, climate change related natural disasters just since the last election there. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the effects of future um, natural disasters, which do happen in Australia but are happening more frequently, uh, is going to continue to cement the hold of pretty much any party that's willing to respond and offer some, you know, really, uh, some really progressive or really forward-thinking policy to grapple with how to deal with these disasters as they come. Yeah, it's almost like that we need this massive sort of rupture uh, in order for like stuff to happen, right? In order for 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 transformation, uh, political trans. It's sort of like a you know, it, it's a shame, but it's sort of we, you know, the the the, the day to day lives of people need need to fundamentally change and for them to realize such an abstract uh thing as 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 climate change well tyler thanks heaps for um coming on and explaining a bit of the uh aussie election to us uh and if anything else ever comes up we'll be sure to 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 get in touch cheers hey thanks for thanks for having me on